When I first started in oncology many years ago, when someone had a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer, we kind of went in ready to um, work with... <laughs> That's all right. Wrong group. <laughs> we, we came in ready to talk with someone about the end part of their life. I mean, that's how it was. And the whole world has changed in the last, even the last 10 years, but certainly the last 15 years, everything changed because they came up with these treatments that kept people alive for a long time and relatively well. And there were options even when something stopped working that there was another thing to take. Um, and that's fantastic. But one of the things that we very quickly was hearing was that's all very well, but that means I'm actually living with this for longer and the coping with it and people don't understand what it's actually like. Um, and I think there's been a process of, of even all the health professionals, the oncologists, the treatment people across the board catching up with what that experience is like. So what I want to do is go through with you what I have heard um, this experience is like, and maybe some of the understandings we have about why it might be that way. Um, I have not had cancer at all, and so you need to say, actually, it wasn't like that for me. But let's go through, and, and also what things have seemed to help. And the first thing I'd say is, um, it's wonderful to have you here, and it's really brave of you to come Sorry. here. Totally fine. The two important women are here, so I can get started now. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Um, so this statement of you never know how strong you are until strong is your only choice um, really resonates with me personally. I've had um, a number of family deaths in the last five years and people keep telling me how wonderful I am and I'm like, not sure what else I was supposed to be. And I'm sure that that is a bit the case. You don't have a choice but to cope. Um, and, uh, but also that we don't actually know how many resources we have in us until we're really made to face it. Um, and I think, as Tracy, you were saying this morning, the, um, the thought of having a recurrence is like, if that happens, I'll never be able to cope. Or if I have to have chemotherapy again, there's no way I'll ever be able to do it. And yet, somehow, we do it, because we do what's in front of us. This is a quote from one of the women I worked with. Um, it's very simple, but nothing can prepare you for a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. And let me just tell you this, um, uh, this other quote, which I think really encapsulates, for me, my understanding of this experience. So this woman said, I felt angry, and then hopeless, and then panicked, and then I think I was depressed. I had trouble eating and sleeping. It was like an emotional flood with so many thoughts going around in my head. What about this person? What about that person? What about me? And I think that flood is, um, encapsulates how many things go on in your head. Um, plus, aren't I so lucky and isn't it great that I'm loved and I'm so glad that this person's here in my life? So many things that we know it's hard to get to sleep at night because that ruminating of all those thoughts. I don't know if any of you have seen um, any of these cards. They're by Emily McDowell, and you can see them online. And she has put out these really cool cards that kind of just say it like it is. So this one says, I promise never uh, to refer to your, journey, your illness as a journey unless someone takes you on a cruise. Um, some of the terminology that people use, you kind of want to go, you know what, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but it is a process. Um, and I think Michelle was talking about that today. It's like you have this road that you have to go on. You suddenly put on it. You have nowhere else to go but along this road. Um, but it's not, it's not linear at all, is it? You kind of go along and something, and you go, OK, that bit's not so bad. And then you go, oh, God, now I've got another thing to cope with. And then I thought I was doing OK. And you go in and out. Now, this road is um, not very far from where I live. I, so I live in Launceston. I wish I could look oh. more around here. Oh, but yeah, it is beautiful. Um, but this road, it's called Jacob's Ladder. 
and it's the road you go up to our closest ski field to Launceston. And it's one lane. And so if you're going up it and someone's coming down, you reverse down to one of the corners. And I've had, I, I could actually track my life on my experience of Jacob's Ladder because I had the, you know, the early when I was a child, it was really funny and cool. And then teenagers going up there with um, friends driving who thought it was really funny to rock the car and you go up. Um, and then as I've gotten older, I am more and more terrified of it. Um, but I feel like it's a bit like this kind of windy um, experience. And it's also like this river, um, which I, I've learnt this morning is Tunaba. Sorry? That's your river. Um, I, I understand from uh, in the language it's called Tunaba. Um, I was trying to work out because I've heard a couple of different names for it now. Because let's face it, it's such a long river, there probably are different names. Um, but I thought this made it even more, even more clear um, that the Fitzroy River, it goes like this. And that's kind of what the journey is like. One of the big things that I think is useful to kind of go back and understand is that getting a diagnosis of a cancer, getting a diagnosis of a um, second cancer or a metastatic cancer is, it's a transition in life. Having a baby is a transition, getting married is a transition, finishing school is a transition. Now that, I don't want to downplay the experience, but all of these things are the same in that we go from being who we were at this point and then we cross over to who we are at the end of it. And I often, um, when I was working more clinically, would be referred people when they were on the middle of the bridge. This is a really uncomfortable place to be. It's when you don't know what's coming, you're suddenly on this unfamiliar place, you suddenly are meeting all these new people with treatment centres and people that you've got to call, all that, everything's been turned upside down. And so you're doing this transition across. And so if we think about, all of the things that have to adjust, um, it's part of the transition. And along that bridge, obviously, there's some things to watch out for. And I don't know that we're that good at, at preparing people for that, but let's go through some of them. So the first one is that information can be a really mixed blessing. We know it's really, really empowering and important to get clear information. It's one of the things that BCNA is um, built on. Um, but we also know that the week before your diagnosis of breast cancer, you could read something about breast cancer and you go, that's interesting, or gee, that's sad, or that's really good. And then as soon as it is your life, it's so full of emotion. And I don't know whether this is your experience, but it feels like it's everywhere. You know, once you've actually got it, it's like it's in the paper and then some celebrity's got it and then it's on TV and then there's a October and there's breast cancer month. And, um, and so the important thing about this is to acknowledge that information is really value laden and that you need to choose when you go surfing on the net, um, use it to ask questions rather than give you the answers and just be really mindful about getting the information as you go because one of the hardest things is living with uncertainty and one of, that makes us want to keep finding an answer to all these unanswerable questions. And so we need to be really careful about information. Here's another card. Um, I'm so sorry you're sick. I want you to know that I will never try to sell you some random treatment I read about on the internet. So of course, the other thing about information is um, that there's lots of people in our lives that seem to think that they, it's good for them to be generous, to tell us about their thoughts or their auntie or their person that they read about who had this treatment for a completely unrelated cancer 20 years ago anyway. All that stuff that we know, we get so much thrown at us. And it might in the beginning be, okay, oh, that's really good to hear that. And after a while you would wanna go, actually, I'm gonna filter what I hear because actually it's all really hard. We talked a bit about this this morning and I just mm. Unpack it a little bit. One of the things to watch out for is the pressure to be positive. And um, it's the pressure that's more important here than the concept. If you're feeling 
positive and like, okay, I've got this information, but it's funny, I actually feel okay. I feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm gonna face what I have to face and I'm gonna go on. That's one thing. If you are feeling like mm, your head is gonna explode and you're just like, this is so terrifying. I can't believe this is happening. I can't face anyone. I don't wanna to talk to anyone, but I'm gonna go and see some friends and I'm gonna actually put on a smiling face and go, it's all fine. Um, the pressure, there's enough pressure. <laughs> There's enough pressure that we cannot take away. This one we'd like to take away. There is no evidence. There's no evidence at all that if you are more positive that you will um, live longer, that you'll do better with treatment. There is evidence to say that if we learn how to manage our psychological health through this experience, that we will be healthier mentally and physically, um, but it doesn't shift whether someone survives or not. And there were some studies done in the 70s that kind of started intimating this. And that's part of where the pressure comes. You've got to be positive. If you're not positive, you're not going to survive and I really need you to survive. So the most normal thing in the world, if someone comes and pulls the rug out of your life, out from under you, is that you have days where you go, I'm not enjoying this. Um, the other most normal thing is that you will then have days where it's okay. What's not normal is that you just smile all the time and it's all fine and you don't get to say to anyone, actually, I'm really struggling. What we do know is that there are some people in our lives who really need us to not talk about our fear. And that's why it's really good to go to healthcare professionals and say, I'm terrified and I don't really want to do this because maybe our family can't hear that at the moment. Um, but don't ever push down those feelings because they're just normal adjustment processes. How many of you dislike when people say, gosh, but you look so good. You look good. Yeah, you feel guilty. Yeah, yeah. What am I supposed to? Yep. 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 Yes, that's right. It's one of the things about living with metastatic disease. People still don't know what that actually means and go, hang on a minute, I thought you had metastases and yeah, you're still here. How are you feeling? <laughs> that's right, that's right. I think one of the things behind these statements, so someone saying, wow, you look good, um, Depending on where you're at at the time, you don't have to accept anything. But if you can maybe take it as a gift, and if you can take it maybe with some compassion, because people, one of the subtexts behind you look good is, I need you to look good. I need to not see you looking sick, because I don't know how to do that. Now, you might want to say, do you know what? I don't care, because I'm the one living with this. But if you're kind of going, how do I, how do I deal with those well-meaning things? And maybe take it like you take a gift that you didn't really want, and you open it and you go, thanks, that's but really horrible. But you say that yep. too, mm -hmm. it can make you feel good as well. Yes, absolutely. Because then yep. they almost feel, it makes you feel like you're, you're just normally living life like yep. everyone else. Yep. You, you know, they think that you're just the same as... Yeah. yeah. Or they're complimenting you, yeah. and you might yeah. look really and it good. Can be nice. Yes, it yes. Is, yeah. It's Sometimes so. It, it's just, just. They don't know what to say. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like when you meet someone you haven't seen for a while, yeah. they go, "How's he going? Oh, yeah, my oh, good. grandfather passed yeah. last week. What, oh. what do you say? Yeah, that's yeah. right. You don't yep. know. Yep. No. I mean, you can you can say to them, you know, how are you going? And you go, if they say you look so good, they may think, well. You know, you might be doing really, really bad. They really don't, just don't know what to That's say. That's right. They don't want That's to right. How are yep. you going with your treatment? Oh, yeah. You know, I've only got six months left. That's right. They don't know. They don't know how to respond to that. So yep. I'm just going, well, you look good. It's like you've got a nice haircut. Really disgusting. But yeah. it's a nice haircut. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't suit me yeah. at all. Yeah. All this is going on in here. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. If, you, if anyone has to be bored, you can be bored because you've got such a nice Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's, 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 that's a good one. That's a good one. You got that one? Um, but I, I mean, so I guess what we're saying is just to process that stuff because what can happen is we go for a walk down the street, we're kind of feeling okay, then someone says something like this and then we're walking down going, oh God, this is horrible or I don't know how to take it. 
It's about kind of being able to stand back and go, okay, where am I at today? That's that person, that's not me, all that sort of stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that in a sec. You just go, hell yeah, I do. Hell that's yeah. right. <laughs> That's right. Yep, if you can. <laughs> um, I think one of the other things that was talked about this morning is that, you know, one of the, I think one of the hardest things that I hear is carrying the weight of the sadness of the people around us. Um, and of course, it's not our fault. And I always talk about the fact that cancer comes into a family. It comes in through the door and it affects everyone in that family. And I use that term really loosely. So anyone in your life that's important. It comes in and it affects um, everyone. It's not that it came into you and it's your fault that it's made everyone else sad. Um, yeah, impact on family. One of the ways that I talk about this is that, um, if, you remember, if any of you know of these mobiles, so they're, they're kind of weighted to each other. And so if you think about this a bit like a family tree, and say the blue piece is the person with cancer. And so it's just hanging there. Families need to go back into equilibrium all the time. You'll notice that if anyone starts to change their behaviour and kind of pulls them back. So it's hanging there straight. Someone comes in and they get cancer. And mm. Click that piece. Whole thing goes like this. But all the pieces move in different ways. Some will flick around. Some of them might get tangled up. Some of them might just kind of move a little bit. <laughs> but it impacts everyone. Um, and it's therefore important that we, as healthcare professionals, acknowledge that it is a unit of care. And we're not great at this, um, but you know, I, would, I wish that when someone is diagnosed that we go, what does everyone in this family need? And we step in with all the services, um, yeah. Now partners, you, there might be some people here who had partners who were not helpful. Um, absolutely know some people who had partners who leave, um, but I know so many partners who were the amazing backbone of what was going on in the house. And what we do know, because we've done quite a lot of research on this now, is that if you could measure how stressed is the patient, how stressed is the partner, they look quite different, the stresses are different, but they're probably at least equal. Some studies have shown partners' stress is even higher. Because if you feel like you don't have control over what is going on in your life, they really don't have control. Um, so again, we need to be better at supporting partners, preparing partners. Do we know what percentage of marriages break down? No, I don't actually. I'm gonna look that up in the lunch break and talk to you. I must say, for my you know, clinical experience that it's it's the minority that I've been asked to get involved with, but I'm, and I'm talking potentially four, five years. Post. Yep, down the track. Yep. What we know is that the experience is it's a very different experience. So if we talk about the moment uh, the person was diagnosed and the moment they finished their treatment, if you like, and we go, okay, that was a six month period. Um, for the acute kind of treatment I'm talking about, um, those two people will have gone through completely different journeys. And so often it's at that point when maybe that initial flurry of medical stuff all dies down that partners go, okay, I don't know where you're at, I just want everything to get back to normal or you have no idea what I went through. Um, and that's actually when I'm, I'm most asked to come in. It is down the track a bit. Um, to kind of go, okay, what was it like for you? I want you to listen to what it was like for him or her and vice versa. And let's talk about what this means for the future. Um, it's 11.1 yeah. out of 1,000 married breast cancer survivors experience divorce after a cancer diagnosis. 11 point out of 1,000. Out of 1,000. Yeah. Yeah, it is like, but that's divorces. So that's not talking about what's going on behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, now, impact on children. Um, the thing that we know about children is that cognitively, um, up until, gosh, it's actually getting later. Some, some say 20 is when you start to actually get sort of a mature mind. But, but little people, their minds are built to see themselves as the center of the universe. 
Um, it's one of the cute things when you, you know, you give bad news and they go, oh yeah, it's really sad. Can we still go and play basketball tonight? And you're kind of like, my God, where's the compassion child? That's how they're built. Um, and the other side of that is that when we don't explain to them what's going on, they will almost always turn it around onto themselves. That's because that's how their brains are built. Um, and so I've certainly occasionally gone and talked to children on my own when I've had parents who just cannot deal with it. So normally when I have parents come and say, I'm a bit worried about the kids, or I don't know how to talk to the kids, I'll say, let's practice together and then you go and do it because that's much better. But what I can tell you is that every time I've been asked to go and talk to children, and it's usually about um, getting to the end of treatment and something not working very well, and I start with what do you think's going on, they know so much. They usually have some very scary skewed pieces that they needed someone to go, no, that's not going to happen. Um, but they've picked up. They've picked up from the silences. They've picked up for when everyone stopped talking when they came in the room. They've overheard conversations. So um, we could do, obviously, a whole talk on this, and I'm really happy to speak to you about specific things later. But what we know is they need to be involved in an age-appropriate way, and then they need to get on with their lives. They need to have as little disruption as possible because what's still important to them is that they get to see their mates and they get to go to school and those kinds of things. Um, and then two years later, they are older and then they might have new questions. So the door needs to be open um, to all of that. Um, friendships. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand, but I can tell you that the majority of people that I have worked with, with who have breast cancer have at least one friend that they would have sworn would have been there if this happened, and they were not there. It's not you, <laughs> I'm telling you, it is so common. Um, and equally, most people have someone in their life, good Lord, seriously? <laughs> Sorry, it's a five minute warning, I'm gonna have to jump um, ahead. Yeah, I know, I know, but there are a couple of things. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go quickly. Um, some people that you just never would have thought were there and they were just there. That is just the reality of this. And we know it's about the fact that people have their own stuff, um, but it hurts like hell and it's one of the additional things that we have to um, cope with. I'm really happy for you to have the slides too if I'm rushing through. Lovely McGrath nurse, who I can't see your name. Sally. Yeah. Oh, you're Sally. Okay, yeah, yeah cool. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna flick through because I wanna go through some how do we cope. Um, so this card says, I'm really sorry, I haven't been in touch. I didn't know what to say. Wouldn't that be great if we could just hand those out and go, just send me this? Because I'd rather you said that than just didn't know what to say. But, um, and this one, when life gives you lemons, I won't tell you a story about my friend who died of lemons. Um, so we need to still have that sense of humour. Embrace the people who rally around you during this tough time. And this slide, which I won't kind of read through, but this was um, a woman explaining, she went, was asked to go to an anniversary party and she went and there were lots of her friends around and she was happy for the person, but she also felt like, you know, the world's going on around me and they don't even know what this is like for me. Um, and I can't stand those little things that people get upset about because they have no clue. Um, but I still want to be part of it and that tension of what that's like and impact on me. So the big thing is, I guess, impact on the future and how do we keep going. It's a delicate balance of hope with the chaos. And it goes like this constantly. You don't ever get it right, but you're constantly managing that. So let me tell you a couple of things that can help. So the first is that we need to acknowledge the emotional distress. I've probably said that in a few different ways. It's just, it's not because I'm focusing on any of the distress part or the suffering of this. It's that there is so much pressure to not acknowledge it. Um, and if you've never had anxiety before or never had down days and now you're having them, it makes sense and there's stuff we can do to make it better. So pretending that it's not happening is not helpful. Focusing on now, Tracy, I think you might have said something about this today. This is one of the big tricks so when you're going, I, I hate living with uncertainty, I don't know whether I can make a plan for the middle of next year or all of those things. 
you focus on now. So you see this staircase here and that's everything feels overwhelming because I'm looking too far ahead and I don't know the answers, no one knows the answers. You come back to that step in front of you. Just focus on this and then um, you can manage this. And the just focus on this will change from day to day. So it might be when I've just heard I've got to start different treatment, that treatment's not working anymore. Oh my God, cannot cope, this is too big. All I can focus on is, can I get through to lunch today? Can I get through to um, the next couple of days? Or can I make a plan for this weekend? I can't think beyond that. And then as things go on, you'll have other times and you might make go, okay, I know what we're doing for Christmas this year. And then it needs to bring it right back again. Because you can cope with right now. Um, it's just that no one can do the big, um, the big thing. This is the bit I really want to go through with you. And that's about challenging automatic negative thoughts. Don't believe everything you think because we have, we're not great at um, our thoughts that come in. I don't know if any of you have heard about this. It's, so this is cognitive behavioural therapy, it's called, if you ever want to look it up. But basically what we know is that a situation happens and then we have a thought. Sometimes we don't even acknowledge what that thought was. That leads us to a feeling, which leads us to a physical reaction, which leads us to a behaviour. And often the thought can be wrong, often. And so what we can learn to do is to go back and challenge that thought. So let me give you an example. So the situation is that you hear that some of your friends went out without you. Now the thought might be, and this is called negative thinking, uh, they don't really like me, I don't mean anything to them. Now these thoughts can be fleeting. That might be just kind of a belief. It's not like I sit there and go through that. I just kind of have this feeling. I acknowledge the feeling. But so that's a thought. I feel down. I start to get a headache and tight shoulders and I withdraw and I don't contact them. So I don't actually ring them and go, how come you guys went out and didn't ask me to come out with you? I just don't contact them. Um, another one, oh. So what we need to learn to do is to go back and go, okay, why did I start feeling tense? It was because I assumed that they don't like me. What am I going to do about that? Because I don't really want to live with this feeling. Automatic negative thoughts, some of you will um, recognise one or two of these as being ones that you do. Black and white thinking, I'm either going to be cured or I'm going to die. Overgeneralisation, my husband spends so much time taking care of me, I'm such a weak and needy person. So you kind of generalise from something. Discounting positives, uh, my test results show that treatment is working, but I think the cancer is going to come back anyway. Mind reading. We often do this with our partners, I find. Um, my friend hasn't called me to see how I'm doing because she doesn't care about me. I'm going to go a couple of minutes over and I apologise. <laughs> um, and should statements. Pull yourself up if you hear yourself saying shoulds. I should not burden my friends or family and ask for help no matter what. So these are the things that bring in these negative thoughts. So here's another example. Uh, you notice your shoulder hurts when you've been hanging out washing. The thought might be, oh gosh, I hope it's not the cancer. I might start finding that I'm starting to, to breathe fast and my heart's racing. Um, I go to bed and withdraw. I feel panicked. I avoid going to the next appointment with the oncologist. What we can do is go back and go, okay, when did I start feeling like this? It was when my shoulder hurt. What was I thinking? I'm thinking maybe it's something that's happening again with my body. I need to challenge it. So there are lots of reasons why my shoulder should, could be sore. I should address it and then move on. So I might do some breathing and go, let me just calm myself down because that just happened from that soreness. I, I, there's something I can do about it. And then I might say, I'm going to use some Panadol and a heat pack and I'm going to give it two days. If it's still sore, I'm going to make myself go to the doctor. So that goes from I'm in bed and I don't want to talk to anyone to okay, I've, I've grabbed hold of this. Give you one more example. Um, you're due for another scan. We know scan anxiety is fun. Um, and as I said, often the feeling comes first because we haven't acknowledged a thought. So you might just be strutting around, scans in two days, and you're feeling tense and you've got a headache. 
you're not able to sleep and you're snapping at everyone. There's tension in the house and you feel like, gosh, I'm not coping and I wish this, you know, this is still impacting my life. The thought is it's going to show that the cancer is back and the treatment hasn't worked. So that's where that's all coming from. Understandable fear, but understanding that that's what happens two days before every scan means I need to embrace that and deal with it. So how can you fix it? Stop and think about why you're feeling tense um, and make a plan to address that. So you might say to everyone um, that this is a scheduled part of my care. Of course I'm anxious a couple of days before. This is what's happening everyone. Stay away from me or just, you know, I need time or I need to watch a movie with everyone. Um, and then plan for the lead up of the scan and make sure it doesn't just come upon you. It's, if you can learn to do some of these challenging, it's, it's really um, helpful. Letting go of the things that you can't control, because gee, we hold on to them, but I need to be able to change this. So you can't, so you have to let go of those. So um, you, can, you can let go of the need to be perfect, um, of living up to others' expectations, the fear of failing, self-doubt and comparison, mm -hmm. the need to please everyone. But there's some things that you can't control and those are the things you need to go, I don't like this, but I can't do anything about it. And I'm coming to the end. Um, this is part of what I did my PhD on. What we know is that the people who have more meaning in their life manage better regardless of where they're at medically. And by meaning in their life, what I mean is remembering the things that bring you joy or peace. Often we don't spend a lot of time doing it. Sometimes we even, when I do this in therapy with people, we have to go right back to, can you remember as a child when you were happiest? It might have been on the beach, or it might have been, I don't know, doing jigsaw puzzles. Let's do some more of that. So this is about rebalancing. So we're not just focusing on the suffering and the doing, but we're actually rebalancing. So it's the pursuit of little meanings. Might be the fascination with nature, which we know some of these things become even clearer when we're going through a difficult time. Doing what you love. Might be stage um, diving like this guy, but you know that feeling. Gosh, it's when you forget yourself, you forget the time, you just, here I am, I love doing this thing. Riding horses, whatever it is. Kindness to other people. The simple beauty in the world. This is my dog, Gertie and some things that I picked up as I go beachcombing. Um, these are not little things. These are the things that get us through each day. And we have to almost prescribe them in to our week. So we're doing more of this. I promise you this is not just a little twee thing. This actually shifts everything, connection with others. So I guess what I want you to do is to check in with yourself today of what do you need right now? It changes all the time. Is it, there's some information I still need. Do I need to speak to this friend? Do I need to let go of that friendship? What do I need? Do I need a massage? But specifically, what do I need right now? And the final one is that it's really important to give yourself permission to not be brave sometimes. Courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. Um, there are some days when you're allowed to just go, well, that was a day <laughs> and, um, and that's totally okay. 